Welcome to the House of God virtually. And we appreciate that you are with us here at our 10 a.m. time slot for the God's Word for Life lesson today. And I'm excited about the Word of God and what it means to us and how precious it is and, and how it helps guide us and lead us in our everyday lives. The, the big idea of our lesson today is that I will respond, and I'm going to have you say this here in just a second, but I will respond to Jesus and follow Him as His disciple. So wherever you are right now, let's say it again. I will respond to Jesus and follow Him as His disciple. One more time, I really wanted to get ingrained in you. I will respond to Jesus and follow Him as His disciple. I want to start today by focusing on a, uh, about three or four verses. It's found in the book of Luke, chapter number 6. And here's what it says in verse 13. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose twelve of them to be apostles. Here are their names. Simon, whom he named Peter, Andrew, Peter's brother. There was James, John, Philip, and Bartholomew. And then there was Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, and then Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. The truth about God today is that God does not force people, but He invites them to follow Him. And I'm thankful that God is very much a gentleman. He does not force you to like Him, love Him, follow Him. He just says, why don't you come? It's just a, it's an invitation to follow Jesus, and that's how Jesus operates. So to get things kicked off, I want you to get ready to post in the comments, and here's your big task for the day. We'll take about 30 seconds, so you're going to have to be fast. So here it is. Using just one word, describe a disciple. Using just one word, describe a disciple. Go. you got 30 seconds. All right, here we go. Lots of great comments. Uh, what you think a disciple is, your description. There was a, a giant Christian denomination that was facing a lawsuit, and it came from two missionaries, of, of all things. One complained that on the mission field, he had developed digestive issues and ulcers because of the food that he had to eat in the country of his calling. The lawsuit claimed that the denomination must reimburse him for what he had lost. Another missionary complained that her many years of service in the tropical regions caused the development of skin cancer on her body. She also followed legal counsel that encouraged her to demand reparations from her church body for job-related illness. Leaders of the denomination met to prepare a legal defense against the allegations, and one of them grieved that apparently those former workers who had once claimed to be willing to give their lives for the gospel now had decided that didn't include their stomach or their skin. To what extent should believers be willing to give themselves for Jesus? How, how, much, how much does God expect of a believer? And how much can one learn from the examples set by Jesus' first disciples and what He required of them? Because the Bible uses the word disciple and shows the importance of being a disciple, a believer wants to be one. There's a desire there. Sadly, as with most things in a person does not understand, believers often assume they are disciples. And just as being a good parent means more than having a child with one's own last name, so being a disciple is more than just another label that a person adopts. You, you can't just slap the, the uh, bumper sticker on the back of your car and say, well, I'm a disciple because I got, I got a sticker that says so. Certain values and actions define a person as a true disciple of Jesus Christ. A look at the first disciples and how Jesus taught them will help us gain a healthy sense of our roles in service to Him. You see the kinds of risks that He required of them, and then also learn what our Lord expected of those pioneers of the kingdom. First of all, Jesus taught the people from Peter's boat. And one of the first things that leads someone to become a disciple is the characteristic mentioned in Luke chapter 5 and verse 1. A crowd developed around Jesus, and they were eager for one thing, to hear from God. 
I want to stop here for a moment, and, and I just want to drive this point home that if anything in our life, if we can understand anything, is we need to hear from God. We can't just go on hearsay. We can't just go on just the words from the pastor, from the teacher, from the prophet, from the evangelist. We must hear from God. And the way that we hear from God is by getting into our prayer closet, taking time, setting aside time, and talking with Jesus. We converse. It's a back and forth conversation. We, we talk to God and then we stop and we listen to hear what God has to say to us. The Word of the Lord meant so much to these people that they pressed in to see and hear Jesus. When's the last time that you were somewhere that you had to really press in to hear the Word of God? You, you said, I've got to get close. I, I want to make sure I listen to the voice of God. They had pushed aside other things from their day and were even pushing other people out of the way because they were hungry for the Word of God. As their spiritual hunger began to push Jesus into a place of physical danger, he found a solution. Rather than let the mob push him into the water, he rose above it. Using the most advanced sound system of the time, Jesus spoke from the boat to the crowd gathered around him on the slope bank of the lake. If speaking from a boat across the still waters was a form of public address, then Simon Peter was the first sound man. Keeping the boat at the right distance for all to hear, Peter gladly used his workplace for ministry. Did you get that? Peter gladly used his workplace for ministry. The, scripture, the Scriptures draw those who desire to know God. It, it, there's a drawing that happens by reading the Scripture. Saying a person should press into the Word of God may not stir the right motivation. However, reading the Bible out of guilt or a sense of duty cannot compare to being drawn to it by a spiritual hunger and a love for the God of the Word. And how do you get that desire? Prayer, again. It's that conversation with Jesus Christ. The more time you spend with Him, the more time you're going to want to spend with Him. No one told those people that they had uh, that they come to hear Jesus. They, they wanted to. It, it wasn't like, hey, you you got you to gotta come and hear Jesus. You, you have to. If you don't, we're going to arrest you. It was they wanted to. To hear Jesus. If a believer struggles with a desire to hear from the Lord via scripture and prayer, that person simply needs to revisit the wonder of who he is. When the Word of God, Jesus, spoke about the Word of God, the scriptures, the message came alive. The closer we are to the Lord, the more the Bible will live when we read it. Second question for today Are you drawn to the scriptures or driven to them by obligation? Are you drawn to the Scriptures, or are you driven to them by obligation? You see, Peter recognized Jesus was Lord, and Jesus did not come speaking random facts and, and regurgitated information. His message brought transformation. It would not be enough for him to speak, but he came with power for real needs. He moved directly from speaking to addressing Peter's failure, which was not catching fish on the night shift, and the Lord's solution was to send Peter back out to fish. Can you imagine that? Peter's like, yeah, this didn't work out. And Jesus says, well, I've got a solution for you. I want you to go back out and go fishing, <laughs> fishing again. Peter explained how fruitless his efforts to catch fish had been, but then something changed in his response. When Jesus asked him to cast his nets again, Peter agreed, even though he felt it was a little ridiculous to try by that time. However... When he did as instructed, that's the point, that's the key, when he did as instructed, when we will do as instructed according to the Word of God, when we follow the direction of the Scripture, when we follow the direction of the Holy Spirit, things turn out great. Peter, he, he was shocked. The elusive fish suddenly showed up in massive numbers. For the expert fisherman, embarrassment gave way to amazement. Jesus had shown himself as more powerful than Peter in the man's own domain. Peter, that was his domain. That was He was an expert at it. That's It's what he did every day. And then here Jesus shows up and says, I've got a solution. Why don't you go back out and go fishing again? Let's see what happens. Jesus knew what was going to happen. So Peter goes back out, goes fishing, and where his domain, where he was king, and he couldn't get the job done, he followed Jesus' instruction 
and the fish came swimming as fast as they could to fill up that net. When Peter realized he was unworthy of his passenger, he told him to get off the boat. The pandemonium of the moment revealed Peter's imprecision at handling his own emotions and responding correctly to the work of the Lord. Peter did get one thing right, though. He called Jesus Lord. Peter, James, and John left everything. They left everything to follow Jesus. Jesus did not take offense at Peter's knee-jerk response. Jesus probably smiled. It, it only looked like Jesus was destroying the nets and boats. Instead, He was preparing Peter for a new trade. Fishers of people. All of those, all of those disciples, several of them were, were, were fishermen. They were going to become fishers of people. Peter was not the only one overwhelmed in that moment. So were Andrew, James, and John, his business partners. To them and to the disciples today, Jesus says in Luke chapter 5 and verse 10, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. Next, Peter, James, John, and Andrew show us how to do discipleship correctly. They left it all on the beach. They walked away from an income that landed them above most wage earners in Israel. They left behind a social identity, an established business reputation, and a stable financial future. Okay, here's a question for you. What have you left behind in your pursuit of Jesus? What have you left behind in your pursuit of Jesus? I must leave some things behind. You must leave some things behind to follow Jesus. Today, Jesus calls His disciples to forsake all. When He called the fishermen, He did not say, what would you like to give up for me? Can you imagine? I mean, if Jesus asked that today, we'd say, well, you know, I've been having a lot of knee pain, a lot of elbow pain for the last six months. I'll gladly give that up for you, Jesus. But that's not what He did. He simply said, follow me. It was that invitation, Matthew 4 and 19. Follow me. He chose for them to leave everything behind. Many people will not serve the Lord until they have let go of their comfort zone. Anyone who loves something more than the Lord will not become all God wants that person to be. The story is told of a husband and wife who began attending church together, and the husband's heart softened, and he opened his heart to be filled with the Spirit of the Lord. His wife, as well, began to desire this experience and wanted to experience the change that she saw in her husband. However, she never had a breakthrough into the presence of the Lord. Her husband and the pastor gathered to pray about this barrier she was facing, and the Lord spoke to the minister and told him, the woman loved something more than God. It was her horse. The woman's husband was disappointed to hear this, and he said, she'll never give up that horse, and she didn't. Then the horse became ill and lay down in the field with no medical explanation. Day and night, she would sit with the horse, trying to nurse it back to health, but after a few days, the horse died. When the wife had recovered from the shock and the grief, she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus called people from all walks of life. It wasn't just the elite. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't just the down and out. He covered the full gamut of people. In that day, much like the present, rulers of certain regions would set up workers to collect duty or customs for them. And a tax collector of that time often had both had a booth near a market on on the road or, or near a port. And the fishermen often had to pay the tax or custom dues on the fish they brought in to sell. Not only did people hate paying those taxes, but they also viewed their fellow Jews who took their money as sellouts to the government. In the area of Capernaum, a man named Levi, Matthew, sat in his customs booth. And we see that in Luke chapter 5, verse 27. And Jesus called the man to come and follow him. Once again, we see Jesus interrupting someone while he was working. Could it be that Jesus looks for people who are busy at work? A lazy disciple is not a disciple. A true disciple must have discipline. Matthew left it all. Luke chapter 5 and verse 28 tells us this. He followed Jesus and fell in stride with Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Those who had once hated paying the fees, Matthew collected from them. Jesus will often call disciples together who have to overcome clashes with each other. We cannot experience the full power of the gospel unless we learn to do life with people whose personalities clash with ours. It's just going to happen. We're different. None of us are just alike. Now, certainly we have people that we know that, that like things that we like, but it's not all the same. Even twins are not the same. 
We're going to have disagreements. And God says, you got to, you got to get together. you got to work those things out and follow me. The power of Jesus helps us overcome old hatreds, wounds, and prejudices. The one who loved his enemies even while dying now lives in us to love our enemies through us. Jesus is no respecter of persons. We've heard it often, but I want you to understand, he's no respecter of persons. When the religious establishment began whining about Jesus spending time with the outsiders, he explained to them his values. He explained that healthy people do not need a physician, but only those who are sick. We see that in Luke chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. First, we follow Jesus. Then, we serve others. If as believers we settle into the comfort zone of close friends in the faith, we will shut out those who need our faith the most. It's very easy to get into a clique and we just spend time only with those that are like, yeah, I really, really like these people. That's all I'm going to spend time with. But when we come in to the faith, when we come into relationship with Christ, and we come into a body of believers, the family of God, we need to spend time with others so that they'll know, hey, this faith is real. This power of God is real that they profess. Jesus seeks for and He loves all people and He offers salvation to whosoever will. Jesus is calling all who will hear to follow Him. Jesus explained to them that He had not come to focus on those who had their lives all together or even those who felt they had it all together. So that pretty much covers everybody. He came to transform those who were hungry, those who were hurting, and those who kept making the wrong moral choices. We must remember that this is our purpose. We've got to stay committed to the mission and the mission of the church's souls. There is purpose behind every calling. Jesus did not call His select group of 12 until after a night of prayer. Jesus, we're talking the creator of the universe, spent time in prayer before making a big decision. In prayer, the Spirit can shape a person's mind and understanding. And in Luke chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, we see that after an all-night prayer time, Jesus called His disciples, identifying 12 of them as apostles. The truth is, Jesus is still calling disciples today. First, He calls us to follow Him. Then, He commissions some to represent Him in a public capacity. God has a specific calling for each of us. It's interesting to note that Jesus chose 12 and named them apostles. Oftentimes in Scripture, the Lord will change someone's name to reflect the person's new identity. An example is Jacob's name was changed to Israel. We like to refer to our spiritual identity as our calling, and God has a specific calling for each of us. There's one particular notable change in one of the apostles. Luke 6 and 14 says, Simon, whom he also named Peter, the rock, the rock. The name Peter means the rock. He called him Simon, but it was the rock. His calling and identity were later confirmed when Jesus addressed Peter as recorded in Matthew 16 and 18, which says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The rock of Matthew 16 and 18 is directly tied to the revelation of who Jesus is. However, it plays off the name Jesus had given to Simon Peter at the outset of his being named an apostle. Here Jesus confirms Peter's calling to declare who Jesus was and to carry the keys of salvation to the world. This officially began on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached to those in Jerusalem. God has a specific calling for each of us. Yours may be different than mine, but God has called all of us to preach the gospel to every creature using the gifts and callings He has given to us. Know this, that when you come to Jesus and when you repent and you're baptized and then filled with His Spirit, you are called right then. Not years later. You don't have to, you don't have to walk around for years going, ah, I, I wish God would tell me... Tell me you know, he's call, has He called me? Am I called? You are called when you're filled with His Spirit. You are called right then and there. That moment, you are now called. So what's next? I will respond to Jesus and follow Him as His disciple. We said that back in the beginning. Most importantly, what does Jesus call you? He does not call you according to your past labels. The Lord did not just name His disciples to help their self-esteem. Their names held meaning for others who met them after their close encounters with Jesus. Simon may have appeared to be shaky or impulsive, but Jesus taught the others to view him as the rock. Jesus 
gives each of us a new identity. Then He commissions each of us to a new role. We cannot live up to our purpose if we refuse to see ourselves the way He sees us. We must pray, God, help me to see myself as you see me. Now, all of that said, I want us to internalize this message today. Abram had to accept the name the Lord gave him. Abraham, father of a multitude. To accept his new identity was to accept by faith what the Lord saw him as. Because at that point, he had no children. It's easy to believe in how great God is, but it is a new level of faith to believe what He says about us as individuals. It's always much easier to say, oh, that's a great person. God's got, God's got a calling on their life. God's, God's really moving in that person. It's easy to believe for somebody else, but we must believe what He says about us as individuals. Faith in God is believing Him enough to trust what He sees in us and what He plans to do through us. God's not just going to name us and then set us on the shelf. God has a plan for us. God wants to use us to further the kingdom. Abraham, Abraham had to leave behind the city that was familiar to go on to the city whose builder and maker was God. Disciples are willing to leave everything behind, whether piles of fish, piles of money, or religious cliques, to be close to Jesus. The closer we draw to Him, the more clearly we will hear His plan for our lives. Peter began working for the Lord with just a boat ride. Then Peter's faith got stretched far beyond what he believed Jesus could do through his vessel. Later, the master called Peter to be his representative. Then he gave Peter the message to preach at Pentecost. It begins with a small thing, and it begins with the simplest thing of saying, I will follow Jesus. Disciples are not just classroom students. Disciples are trained for a mission like military cadets. Our commander has given us everything we need for life and godliness, giving us his own nature. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 details it as we read, By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. We simply must lean in to the identity that he has shared with us by his spirit and his name. Jesus is calling. Are you responding to His call? Do you believe what He says? Leave behind the old life. Live the identity that He has given you and become a true disciple of Christ. I want to close this lesson out today with prayer. Wherever you are right now, if you'll close your eyes and bow your head. Heavenly Father, help us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to set aside every every weight, every weight of the world that could so easily distract us, detour us, take us off the path that you have set before us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to hear your call and help us to spend time with you so that we can hear your voice as you call to us, as you invite us to follow you. Help us, Lord, to step out in faith because it's going to take some faith, Lord, but you have given all of us a measure of that faith. Help us, Lord, to exercise that faith Help us to step out and help us to follow you because we know that if we follow you, Jesus, you will lead us to the greatest experiences in our life. Help us, oh God, to, in the midst of the, the struggles and the trials and the temptations, help us to keep our eyes fixed upon you because if we will trust in you for everything, God, you will take us all the way to glory. Help us, Lord Jesus, to choose to be your disciple. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We need to let our minds, we need to let our hearts be fertile ground that, that Christ can sow into us so that we can bring forth good fruit. In this way, we can bless the kingdom of God. We're going to take uh, just a few minutes now to greet one another online. Take this time. Uh, make sure our guests, our visitors feel welcome today. I'm, I'm looking forward so much to being back in the house of God next Sunday. Please be in prayer that God will just will 
His healing power will just come across this church family, that God will heal us, and uh, we can be back together. There's nothing like being in the house of God together. Together. We'll begin our main worship experience here in a few minutes at 11 o'clock, so stay tuned.